The next speaker is Margaret Merlin, who is a master beekeeper and holds the national diploma in beekeeping. Margaret's talk will cover exam techniques and what the candidates need to do to be successful with taking the, the BBK modules. She will go through typical module one questions and as an example for her presentation. Hello everybody, I'm Margaret Murdin. I'm past president of the BBKA and I'm going to do a workshop today about module one of our examination series. So let's have a look at module one. Section A, it's in three sections and we're going to do each section in turn. So section A has got 10 questions and it's intended to be an icebreaker. It's not a make or break deal with this exam, but it is intended to put people at their ease, get them used to doing the exam and be a bit of an icebreaker. They are meant to be fairly straightforward, easy questions. They want very short answers. So they want answers which are either one word or a couple of words, a phrase, certainly nothing more than a sentence. So don't think you've got to, if you've got to think about it, leave it and go on to the next one. You write them on the question paper. And you won't have any choice from now on because it's going to be done online. Um, but if we do move back to the paper version, which we will be doing, we hope, and sometime in the future, you write them on your question paper. And it's one mark each. So section A is 10 questions. 10 marks and we need you to do them in 10 minutes there are no trick questions they're intended to be straightforward easy to answer questions it's a mark a minute okay and here are some here are some examples of what you're likely to find on module one section a but remember that for this next exam it will all be online the exams this april will be done via an online examination um, program called Inspira that we've we've practiced. You get some practice for doing it, but that doesn't mean you've got more time or that you can write for a long time. So name one design of feeder suitable for use in autumn and one in the spring. It requires two answers. So a, a feeder suitable in the autumn, Ashforth or Miller. One suitable in the spring would be something like a rapid feeder or a contact feeder. All you need is one of each, straightforward, two simple answers. Which piece of bee equipment is a porter associated with? Well, it's the porter bee escape. So all you write is the bee escape. Nothing else. You don't need to write a sentence, just a very simple, straightforward answer. Name two methods of frame spacing. Again, you, you've got a lot of choice here. You can use Hoffman, you can use Miller, you can use plastic ends, you can use castellations. All you need to do is write two words. Any of them will do. Don't worry about writing any, any more than two. What's the best time to move bees? Well, either late at night, when they have all stopped flying. So you move your bees when they've stopped flying, either late at night or very, very early in the morning before they've started flying again. What's the dimensions of bee space? And again, you can either give it in metric six to 10 millimeters, or you can give it in um, imperial measurements. It doesn't matter. We're not gonna mark you down. We want a straightforward, simple answer. This always um, confuses people because they think, hang on, there's only one type of queen excluder. There's, there aren't. There's a plastic queen excluder. There's one with a frame around it, which is a metal one. There's several sorts of queen excluder. Make sure you know, because it comes up all the time. The international queen marking color, well, you know, can you rear good bees? And it starts with one. So C, can you rear good bees? Will you rear good bees rather? W for white. Okay, so make sure you know them for each year. There are only five of them. Name a design of hive that use short lugs. There's lots of them. Most of the ones that have got somebody's name on them have got short lugs. So I would say straight away the Smith. The Smith hive's got short lugs. That's all you need. Smith is what you have. Brood frames the cold way. Again, straight, easy answer. At right angles to the entrance is the cold way. The warm way is parallel to the entrance, in case you're asked that one. The dadent. 
has the largest frame size. And I have to say, and I'll say this later on as well, the syllabus has been changed a few years ago. You are no longer going to be asked frame sizes. Nobody's going to ask you the exact frame size anymore, so you don't need to learn them. But we might ask you which has the largest one or which one has the smallest one. Two external factors affecting the temper of the colony. External factors. So the weather is an obvious one. The behavior of the beekeeper, I would say, would be the other one. <clears throat> or robbing from another colony or robbing from wasps, something like that. A way in which drifting can be minimized. Again, <clears throat> put up a hedge, put up a fence, put them all in different directions, all the colonies in different directions, facing different ways. But we want a couple of words only. What weight of stores do they need? It depends on the size of the colony. And look at it. It says the average colony here. The average colony, what does it need? 20 kilograms. And again, we don't care whether it's in pounds or metric. Very simple answer. And again, one word answer here. Source of protein in the bees diet. One word answer, pollen. And you'll get your mark. What do they polish their cells with? Propolis. Size of brood frames. I've put this in deliberately because this is from an old question paper. We will not ask that question again. <clears throat> it, was a, it was asked, I think, in 2012, from my recollection, and it won't be asked again. So if you're doing old exam papers as practice and you come across something like this, just ignore it. Again, I've put the syllabus up later on and I've deliberately put on it, you will not be asked frame sizes. Two types of feeder, again, Miller feeder, Ashworth feeder, frame feeder, lots of them. You need two word answer here. Two types of robbing by honeybees. Well, they rob the colony next door or a nearby neighboring colony, but they will also, they will also rob out. If you put your wet supers above the crown board, they will go upstairs and rob them. Two types of bottom space beehives, ratio to sugar for water in the autumn. You can see, this, I'm not going to go through every question. They're very simple, straightforward questions. The thing is, it's not the sort of stuff you can just learn. A lot of it, you're going to have to have done. You need to have done a lot of this. And a lot of the reasons people fail module one is lack of experience. So let's have a look at section B. There are 15 marks for each question in section B. And we want bullet points, please. Again, you're going to be doing this online at home and we want bullet points. And it's one mark for each bullet point. So every question in section B will have 15 bullet points expected. And the, the marker will have a list of those bullet points. Now, it does, it does happen sometimes that a candidate puts in stuff that we hadn't thought about. That will get marked right and you will get a point for it and it will be added to the marking sheet. Okay, so you get one mark for each bullet point. Section B will give you 60 marks. There will be five questions. You will have to answer four of them. And it's one mark for each bullet point. You've got 10 minutes for each question. Bullet points only, please. 15 marks in total for each question. And most of the questions these days are in parts. And the number of marks is next to the question. People often say to me, what are those numbers down the side? Well, I've put one up for you here. This was March 2019, right? And it's very clear. Answer four questions. And you would be surprised at how many people don't read that and answer all of them. We will only mark four of them, but we will mark the four that will give you the best marks, okay? So please, only answer four of section B. And I know people are thinking, how do they get time to do that? They don't because they may make a mess of section C. But please read it, four, please. And if you look here, you'll see question 11 there. Other than for sale, there's 10 item, 10 uses of a nucleus. And you'll see at the side, that's 10 marks. One mark for each point. And we want bullet points. What are the recommended contents of each of the five frames of a nucleus for sale? Five marks, so we want five bullet points. Let's look down to question 12. List the differences and similarities between a colony containing laying workers 
and a colony with a drone laying queen. The differences and similarities, we want 10. You can see very clearly, you've got 10 marks there. List the size of queenlessness, three marks. We want three bullet points, please, there. And for the final two marks, the process by which queenlessness can be confirmed. Now, this is a question that is always done badly. The process by which queenlessness can be confirmed. And people say, put in a frame of eggs and you won't get any marks. Put in a frame of young larva, which will have eggs on it. But if you put in a frame without young larva, you won't, it won't be a test for queenlessness. So it can have whatever you like on it, as long as it's got young larva. So the, the, you'll get your two marks. So you can, if you put in a frame with young larva and eggs or whatever on, and they don't build queen cells, then you have got queen in there. If they build queen cells, you, that colony is queenless. So you can see, the reason I put this up is that it's a, a recent paper, 15 marks for each of those questions. You have to choose four of them. Please read them all. Don't just start at the top and then think, actually, I could have done question 15 better than question 11. And they're split up deliberately to give people a chance of the most marks because you might not be able to do all of it. You might not know about queenlessness, but you might be able to do the differences between the laying worker and the drone laying queen. Okay, so how to set up a queen, a queen right five frame nucleus, and it'll have a number next to it, as you can see here. How to set up a queen right five frame nuke, nine marks. We want nine points as to how you set up that. So if you can only think of five, look at another question. If you can think of 12, fine. Don't put all 12 down. Think which nine are the most important. How can the nuke be developed into a productive colony? Six marks, six points. We want six bullet points to how you're gonna develop this. Put some extra frames in, whatever you're gonna say. You need six points. Now, it might be that you can't do these. You can only do the first one. Fine. But what you can't do is section A from one question and section B from another question. We will only ever look at one of them. We'll look at four questions. And if you do all five, we look at the four with the best marks. We'll mark all five. We'll curse you for it, mind you. And we'll look at the best marks. Let's have a look at section C. Section C is one question only. And it's 30 marks. So why? What some people do is do section A and then do section C. And you'll be able to do that on, on, on Inspira because section C has got 30 marks. And if you get section C right and section A right, you know, you've got, you've got 40 marks there. <coughs> you don't need a lot of marks from section B to pass this. You need to get two of them 15 marks. So it's up to you how you feel about it. But it does require twice the information that you'd get from a section B question. It's equivalent to two section B questions and we've changed it now. It's no longer an essay. You don't have to write an essay. We are not looking at your essay writing skills. We're looking at your beekeeping knowledge. So bullet points are all right, and especially if you're short of time. If you run out of time, put bullet points down, but they must cover everything. What a lot of candidates do, because I mark these, what a lot of candidates do is repeat themselves. If you repeat something, you will only get the answer, you'll only get the mark for it the first time. Okay, so you are wasting time if you repeat yourself. We will read every word that you write and we'll mark every word that you write. So if you want to say it twice, fine, but you'll only get one lot of marks for it. So these things come up all the time. The reason a lot of people do badly on this is because they don't know the difference between swarm prevention and swarm control. If you think, if your colony has got eggs in queen cups, you're into swarm control. If you decide that it's looking like it's a big prosperous colony, it might think about swarming and you're going to split it or give it more room or whatever, swarm prevention. Make sure, get your books out, make sure you know the difference because on virtually every paper, there is a question on swarming. 
And the reason it's on every paper is because it's always badly answered. It's badly answered because people don't know the difference between swarm prevention and swarm control. So this is 2012, section C, question 17. And I've done it in different colors here deliberately. Swarming is the natural method of reproduction for a honeybee colony. That is setting the scene and it is totally irrelevant to this question. The question is, describe the conditions in a colony that lead to swarming. Does, how does the knowledge of these conditions lead to swarm prevention? You need to know the difference, not swarm control. A lot of people on that question would give me a, a, a pagden or a, a new method of swarm control. No, it's asking for swarm prevention. So read the question. The second part, describe in detail one method of swarm control with the outcome that the colony is unlikely to swarm that year and honey production is not compromised. So it's important. You want swarm control. Honey production is not compromised. So you're not talking about splitting the colony and, and putting them in a nuke and things like that. It's not compromised. So think about it. You're doing a vertical split or something like that. The other one that we are likely to ask you is a method of swarm control where you can't find the queen. Now, this is a popular question, and you'd be surprised at how many people get zero marks because they write, and this has happened a lot. I can always find my queen. I mark my queen. I can always find her. So I don't do a method of swarm control where I can't find the queen, I do the nucleus method and I do it like this. And it's a very, very good answer to the wrong question. You have to answer the question that's asked, even if it doesn't relate to what you normally do. It's on the syllabus. So don't say, I don't do this, I do this. It's similarly, about um, we ask a question sometimes about queen rearing or queens. And they say, I don't do this, I do this. Fine, you won't get any marks. Make a list. This is very important. These are the things that come up all the time. Swarm, prevent, how would you prevent swarming and how would you control it? You need to have one method and it doesn't need to be a pagden. How would you collect a swarm? And think about all the awkward things, what you would take with you. Again, it's a favorite question. It could be in a supermarket car park or on a bush. Think how you would do it. Everything that you would take with you, what you would do if there was public, how long you would leave it? Moving bees is a popular one. How will you move bees? And we normally get set a scene to say you're moving them a long way. And we normally say it's in the middle of June. You're move, usually moving them 30 miles in the middle of June. And we do that deliberately. Because in the middle of June, we assume it's going to be very hot. And you're moving them a long way. So you need to put a screen on there and have water with you and spray them with water on the way. So think about it. It's not just taking them around the corner. It'll say in the question how where you're going to move them to. Feeding your bees is another one. Everybody's fed their bees, but you've got feeding them in the spring to stimulate them. Completely different is feeding them in the autumn for their autumn stores or in the June gap if you've got one or if it's raining for three weeks. Completely different. Think about what sort of feeder you would use and importantly, the concentration of the syrup that you're going to give them. Or we might ask you to feed them in January when it's too, too cold for them to come up. You might need to feed them fondant. Or we might ask you about feeding pollen. So have a think about the question and make notes for yourself. How would you unite colonies? This is a, a favorite question. Before you can unite two colonies, they have to be next to each other. So think about how you're going to get the colonies next to each other, because that's where people lose their marks. They're all very good about putting the newspaper on and all the rest of it. And they forget that one's at one side of the apiary and the other's at the other side of the apiary. Or one might be in a nuke box and you might be putting it with a big colony. So have a think about it and make yourself notes. Right. How would you choose an apiary site? What are all the conditions that you need for a good apiary site? And the first one isn't vehicle access. The first one is forage for bees. It doesn't matter how well you can get your car in. If there's nothing for the bees to eat, it is not a good apiary site. Now, 
There's something on the BBKA website about this. There's a leaflet, but there's also, if you go on BeeBase, there's a good leaflet about this. So have a look. How would you choose an apiary site? It's got to be safe for the bees. It's got to be accessible for you. How are you going to treat secondhand equipment? Secondhand frames, you're going to destroy. You can render down the wax if you like. You're not going to use secondhand frames. How would you treat it if somebody gave you secondhand boxes? What's the work in the apiary for a year? And the year can start whenever you like. But for convenience, it's best to start it when you've taken the honey offs. What do you do with them then? How you pack them up for the winter, what you do and how you get them through the winter, feeding them, whether you feed them in January, treating them, all the work in the apiary for a year with regard to those bees. Make some notes for yourself because it comes up all the time. Sometimes we'll ask you, a beginner has asked you, what's the work like in the apiary for a year? Or a, a beginner has asked you, is this a good apiary site? How would I find an apiary site? Nuclei, again, favorite question. Apparently there are about 14 uses of a nucleus. You need to know quite a lot of them. You know, you, you could do it for building up a colony, for queen rearing, there's lots of them. Have a look, have a look on the BBK website and have a look at BeeBase. There's a lot of information on there. Well, let's have a look at the exam technique. You've got 90 minutes and 100 marks. Now I said one mark a minute for section A. It's just less than one mark a minute. So you've got to think about that. You haven't got time to do two lots of section B and cross them out and faff around. It's, it's less than a minute a mark, okay? So you mustn't waste any time. And lots of people fail these exams because they run out of time. Read the syllabus. And yes, there is a syllabus. I've done these workshops at the Spring Convention and people have sat there and said to me, oh, is there a syllabus? didn't realize there was, a, there was a syllabus. Yes, there is a syllabus. And somebody else said to me, well, it's not fair having a syllabus because I can't remember it. I'm sorry, there's a syllabus. And we'll ask anything that's on the syllabus. Anything that's on that syllabus can come up. And yes, something can come up. Something like swarming could come up twice. Something like feeding could come up twice. It's, it doesn't normally happen. Normally pretty well balanced, <clears throat> but it can. Read the question twice and answer it once. A lot of people fail because they answer the question that they wish the examiner had asked them. They answer the question that they knew the answer to, but they didn't answer the question that was actually on the question paper, like the one about swarm control when you can't find the queen. Answer the question, read it twice and highlight any particular so if it says describe or list have a look because that's what we want you to do read the question twice if you can't answer a, a section a question just leave it it's one mark don't puzzle around wonder, wondering about it here is the latest syllabuses now some of the old papers if you dig out the old papers for practice they've got frame sizes on them and if you see i've written in red here no frame sizes, we don't want to know. And if it's new to the syllabus, we highlight it. When this was the 2019 syllabus, some of it was highlighted. The ways of getting wax foundation fully drawn was highlighted. Um, use of wax foundation was highlighted. Regular comb replacement is fairly new on this syllabus. So you need to know how to do it. Regular comb replacement and how it can be carried out. <clears throat> Belly comb change or just move them to one side and replace them slowly. Or you could do a shook swarm every year. Regular comb replacement. Okay. So anything that is new on the syllabus, and there isn't anything at the moment, but there might be if you're doing this next year, it'll be in, in bold. Okay. When, as I say, several of these were in bold when it was 2019 syllabus. So for section B, you write bullet points. If we're asking you to draw, illustrate it, we're not interested in how good you can draw. Simple sketches will do. If you're doing something like a pagden, fine, just draw little pictures, you know, with your pencil or something. You won't be able to do that this time round because you won't be able to do it on Inspira online. Leave enough time for section C or do it first. Remember, it's 30 marks. So you need to leave at least 25 minutes, if not 30, if you can. 
Section C, number your pages. Because what happens normally when you're doing a written exam, number your pages because they might get in the wrong order. And please practice the papers and time yourself. An awful lot of people run out of time. If you're doing this on paper, please start a new page for each answer. We're not short of paper. The BBKA gives enough paper, normally when they're on paper, you get enough paper to have a new page for each question. And the reason we say that is, if you get to the end and you think, do you know what, I've got five minutes and I'm going to go back and put a bit more in question 12, you won't be able to if you've got question 13 right below it. So leave a space in case you've got time and in case you think of something else to do. And I mean that even if you're doing Inspira, you know, move on. You will be able to move back, go back. If you've got time at the end, don't get up and go out. Read, your, read through your questions. And if you started every question on a new sheet of paper, you'll be able to add, put added points. Even if they're out of order, it doesn't matter. You know, if your bullet points are all out of order, it doesn't matter. You'll get your marks for them as long as they're down on paper or on Inspira. Anything highlighted in the syllabus. So if it's in bold in the syllabus, it's very likely to come up. Worker policing was bolded for a good long time. Very likely to come up. Swarming isn't bolded, but it's always likely to come up because everybody answers it really badly. There's just under one minute per mark. 100 marks, 90 minutes. At the beginning, you've got five minutes to read the paper. OK. And when we say that's it, pens down or finished now, you've normally still got time to number your pages. I'm just numbering my pages. You don't need to do it as you go along. I'm just numbering my pages. OK. And I would suggest to you that you do the correspondence course. It's very good. What a lot of people do is study groups. The correspondence course at the moment, I think it's 60 pounds. I think it's going up. But people, I mark quite a lot of them, and the, the people do them as a group. So you, you just pay once, and you have a nominated person to send the papers in. You can all answer different questions. You can uh, discuss them in your group. Everybody can answer a different question. And sometimes I get a paper which says, Justin answered this, Sylvia answered this, Amy answered this. Doesn't matter. As long as one person sends it in, and it's one course, you can all do it together. And if you've got six of people doing it, it's a tenner each and it's well worth doing it, particularly if you time yourself. OK, marking, how do we mark them? So you get 10 marks for Section A. 60 marks in total for Section B. That is 15 marks for each of those four questions. 30 marks for Section C. So you can see if you can't do one of section A, just ignore it and move on. It isn't going to make a big difference to whether you pass or fail. Okay. Now here's the marking. Here's how we mark them. To get a distinction, you need to get 80%. It needs to be exemplary. You have to show a high level of understanding of the concepts and principles involved. Your answers need to be presented in a clear and logical manner. You need to be able to develop ideas support your answers, and where appropriate, they've got to be clear answers. So there has to be logical and clear, and you have to show a very clear understanding to get a distinction, 80%. To get a credit, 70% and 70 and 79%. You need a good understanding of the question, a good knowledge of the concepts and principles, and you need to be directly addressing the question, not wandering off telling us what you, you did last week at your apiary. Okay? Only answer the question. You haven't got time to put anything else down. That's a credit. A pass is 60 to 69 percent. It partly addresses the question, lacks ideas. Some of them are unsound descriptions and you don't clearly understand it, but you understand it enough to pass. Below 60, lacks structure, understanding incorrect or irrelevant, shows considerable misunderstanding of the main concepts and principles, fails to address the question. I've had some brilliant answers to questions that haven't been asked. And I think if only the question said this, that would have got full marks, but the question didn't say that. Now, borderline, 
We often get people who are 59. We look desperately for another mark for you. Again, at the borderline, we always look for more marks if we can find them. They're then sent to the moderator. Each question paper is photocopied in the office normally, and it'll happen again on Inspira. We're going to print them all off. Send them to the office for photocopying, which is where your numbering comes in. And then they'll be sent to two markers. The markers will mark them independently and send them to the moderator. If the marks are a couple of marks difference, the moderator will remark them and look through. If they're borderline, say somebody's failed at 59, the moderator will look through and try and some marks. If somebody is 79, the moderator will look through and try and get that person a distinction. But in the, at the end of the day, the markers and moderator can only do so much. It's up to you to read the question, answer the question. So why do people fail? Lack of experience. People have never moved bees. People have never fed bees. So they don't really know what they're doing. And it, people have never done a swarm control. Somebody once wrote an answer to me saying, in answer to a swarm question, somebody wrote, my bees don't swarm. Well, I'm sorry, everybody's bees would swarm if they, if they got the chance. So that person didn't get any marks. That's a, that is absolutely true that that person wrote that. Lack of experience. They run out of time because they spend too long wondering about section A, wondering which one of section B is to do, and they don't leave enough time for section C. Time yourself. You can't bring a smartphone, but you can bring a little clock or a watch. You can't bring a smartwatch, you'll be asked to leave it, okay? Or there'll always be a clock in the room. Don't answer the question asked. This is one of the, and it really upsets the examiners and the moderators because sometimes they're brilliant answers, like I said, but they aren't an answer to the question that's been asked and they don't read the syllabus. They answer, they think, Oh, feed. I didn't know feeding was on the syllabus. I didn't know swarming was on the I didn't know there was a syllabus. Yes. And it's on the BBKA uh, website under members, under learning on, or under training. One or the other. I can't remember. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we have some excellent questions that came through. Many thanks for those of you who took part. The first question we have relates to uh, how the modules are marked. So the question is on the video on the BBK website. Um, there is a mention that the question asks for five reasons, and your answer in your answer, you need to give uh, um, five uh, reasons for a particular uh, question. What if you give seven answers, uh, and the first uh, two or three of the top answers are incorrect? Um, are these still marked, or uh, only the first five answers are considered? Margaret, would you like to answer this question? If the question specifies that we want five points in an answer, then we will mark the first five points. If you give seven or eight, then we will assume that you haven't read the, the question correctly. We assume that you will read the question, think about the answer, and give the specified number of points in your answer. And yes, if you give six and we've asked for four, we will mark the first four. Even if two of them are incorrect, and the fifth and the sixth are correct. We don't go through and look for as many correct answers as we can find. We assume that the first four are the ones that you want us to mark. Great. Thank you, Margaret, for that. Um, there is a question which uh, I think is very straightforward. Uh, can you tell me where do I access the syllabus, please? Yes. If you go on to the BBKA website, and into the members area, and you have to log into the members area, then you will see education and exams. If you go into that, there will be a section which all of the modules are set out. It'll say the basic assessment, module one, all of this online. Choose the syllabus that you want. You can download it and read it online, or you can print it off as I have here. But remember, it's important to read the syllabus. In, in module one here, there are 35 points in the syllabus, and we will ask you questions about any of those 35. We will make sure we have a balanced paper, but it's very important. People say to me after the exams, I didn't know there was a syllabus. 
There is. It's important that you download it, read it carefully. Thank you, Margaret. Um, the next question is um, about members with disabilities uh, or even learning difficulties. Um, and the question is, are there any provisions for people with dyslexia, etc., to take exams? There's a lot of emphasis on the time allowed. And this makes me think that it will be hard for somebody with any kind of disability to attempt the BBKA assessments. Margaret, could you tell us about the modules, what provisions? Yes, yes. Um, this is very important to me because in a past life, I used to advise the government on um, access for dis disability, people with disabilities. So it's very important to me. The BBKA has an inclusion policy and this inclusion policy encompasses the exam board and all of the exams and the way that they are conducted. On every application form for any exam, there is a space asking, do you have any, do you need any special conditions? Have you got a disability or indeed a learning difficulty? And if, if you tick that box, our exam secretary will contact you and say, what exactly is the problem? And how can we help you to overcome that problem? We aim to make it a level playing field for everybody. We don't aim to let to, to make the person with the disability have an advantage, but a level playing field. So for example, for dyslexia, it depends entirely on how severe the dyslexia is. Some candidates will have an amanuensis. Other candidates will use a, a laptop or a, a screen. Other candidates will simply have 20 minutes extra. So it depends entirely on what the disability is. Clearly, there are some disabilities which are much more severe than others. For example, if there was a blind candidate, they can take the modules. We just need a lot of notice to get them printed in Braille if the person who is blind is a Braille reader. So have a look at the application form. Fill in the disability. If possible, specify what extra help or assistance or time that you would need, and we will contact you and try and meet those needs. We've never yet not met the needs of a disabled person. Great. Thank you, Margaret. So the next question is, uh, what percentage of people pass the examinations? Generally speaking, the biggest failure rate is in module one. And that's because an awful lot of people either look at the syllabus or assume that the, they know what the syllabus is, and they take the, the assessment before they're ready. And we find what we say to people is you have to have the knowledge in your hands, not just in your head. So, for example, people haven't done swarm prevention or swarm control and every year they get them mixed up. So module one, generally speaking, has the highest failure rate. And that's because people who enter for that assessment before they're ready for it. Um, the other one with a relatively high failure rate is the um, advanced husbandry. And that's improving every year because we've been starting to run courses for it. And we now have said that you have to have a, a bigger gap between your general husbandry. But generally speaking, the other modules, some modules are perceived to be more difficult. They're not. They're all at the same level. Um, so people think module one is, is an easier module. It isn't. It's exactly the same level as module eight. Um, but by the time people get to module eight, they've done all the other modules and they know what to expect. So th there is no one, one thing that fits all. It varies year to year. But generally speaking, people fail for the same reasons every year. They're not ready. They don't read the questions. Um, but, but, and, and people have been taking their advanced husbandry too early, but we've remedied that by changing the rules. Great. Thank you. Um, I think it's worth mentioning as well that nationally, the pass rate for the basic assessment is in the region of 98 to 99 percent. So the majority of the candidates uh, taking the basic assessment will pass. As far as the modules are concerned, it does vary a little bit. Margaret already explained. And it does vary anything between, usually between 50 to 70 percent as a pass rate. Uh, general husbandry, we have about 60 to 70% pass rate. And advanced husbandry, I think it's in the region of 
uh, 50 to 60 percent pass rate. So these are the general pass rates of, of most of the uh, more common uh, BBK assessments. The next question is, uh, can I take the modules before I have taken the basic assessment? Margaret, would you like to ask that question, please? Yes. Um, normally, no, you can't. You have to take the basic assessment as the first assessment before you do any other assessments with the BBKA. We expect people who do the modules to have taken their basic assessment. We have made an exception for this, and that's because we have an increasing number of beekeepers who are in prison. And they, some of them don't have beekeeping, don't have an egg, they don't have hives. So they can take their modules, but they don't actually get awarded until they come out if they take their basic assessment. So it was a it was a specific exemption for prisoners or other people who were long term in an institution, perhaps in a hospital or something like that. Normally, no, you can't. Great, thank you. So we have another question. Uh, um, there was a question in 2019 module one exam paper on top bar hives, but that doesn't seem to feature on the syllabus. Can you comment please? So uh, I can answer that question because I had a look at the syllabus. So I'm happy to answer it, but unless Margaret, you are in good place to answer. So yeah, I suppose I can answer the question. Um, the, the top bar hive is not specifically featured in the syllabus, but if you look in module one, 1.1, 1 .1, uh, the very first question part of the syllabus states the types of hives and frames used in, by beekeepers in the United Kingdom, including comparative knowledge of the following hives, National WBC, Smith National Deep, Commercial Langstroth and Dadant. Details of exact frame size will not be required. So here, while we have asked for comparative knowledge of the National WBC, Smith National Deep and Commercial and Langstroth, it says the types of hives and frames used by beekeepers in the United Kingdom. This means that if there is a hive that is used by a beekeeper in the United Kingdom, this will be included or potentially could be included in a question paper. And while the top bar hive, the skeps, the lock hives, the W, um, the um, worry hives, etc., may not necessarily be specified, they could be included in, in some of the questions. So, uh, so yes, there was a question on top bar hive, uh, and you next time you may get asked question on skeps, uh, or you may get asked question on worry hive, just because these hives are commonly used in in the UK, um, and uh, we could make this clearer. Or we could make uh, you know we can revise a little bit the syllabus to actually say um, broadly and perhaps even remove the reference to the specific hive, so it's not so confusing. But um, it does say hives commonly used in the UK, uh, which mean top archives are included as well. And the last question we have is, uh, if you're a member of Scottish Beekeeper Association, can you access any of the resources on the BBK website, for example, uh, sample marking papers? Margaret? Yes, the Scottish Beekeepers Association actually buy all of the exam papers from us. So they will all be on the, the SBA website. Okay, yes, thank you. So these were all the questions that we had. Um, thank you, uh, Martin, for taking part in both presenting and uh, taking part in the question and answer session. And thank you to the audience as well for asking such a set of great questions.